Hello and welcome to our Scope webinar today. Thank you very much for patient. patience. We are a few minutes late, um, but it will be worthwhile because today's theme is fixed income, flexible fixed income investment. And therefore we have fund manager Brian Kloss from Lake Mason Brandywine um, here, who is managing the Lake Mason Brandywine Global Income Optimizer Fund, a very flexible bond strategy, which um, should be kind of an all weather fund um, to weather all um, different bond markets and we've seen a lot over the last years. Um, first rally and now um, a tougher market environment with upcoming rising inflation, especially in the US and maybe also some modest rate hikes on the horizon. Um, but this will be our theme later. Um, first, I would like to start and uh, to say a few words about Brandywine for those who don't know that company yet. Brandywine is a US investment boutique with around uh, 225 employees and sitting in Philadelphia, Singapore, and London. It was founded in 1986 as Brandywine Asset Management. And in January 1998, it became, um, it was owned um, by Lake Mason. And in July, 2020, um, Lake Mason was acquired by Franklin Temple. So um, Brandywine is currently managing around 65 billion US dollar in assets under management and around half of these assets is managed in the US. And the most important um, strategy or asset class is fixed income with more than 50 billion um, AUM. So before we start, um, I just wanted to point out that our participants um, can ask questions during the webinar. So if you have a question, please type them into the chat window on the right hand side and we will get back to you during the course of the webinar. But now um, let's start and welcome Brian. So hi Brian, great to have you um, here today. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I'm excited to talk about uh, Brandywine and the, the multi-sector strategy that uh, you're highlighting in this webinar today. Yes, thank you very much for being here. Um, so um, firstly, could you tell us a little bit about Brandywine? and what the DNA of that um, company is. And of course, we are all curious um, what has changed or if anything has changed after the recent, after the recent takeover by um, Franklin Temple. So let's start with that first. Uh, the takeover or, or the acquisition of Leg Mason by um, Franklin Templeton has gone very smoothly in our estimation. Um, can't speak for the other affiliates, but from our perspective, it's been a very, uh, s seamless and smooth transition, uh, providing values, uh, valuable support across the globe. Uh, Franklin's, uh, as you think about uh, us being a global manager and Franklin being a global footprint, it, it really works very well. And being able to partner with uh, the, the various resources that they have across the globe, it's really broadened our, our footprint even uh, much deeper than where we have been before. So with respect to how anything's changed, nothing's really changed from, from that perspective. Um, but from my perspective, as we think about Brandywine, uh, you really hit on the, the, the nail on the head, Barbara, at the beginning there, when you said we're a boutique asset manager. Um, when you think about Brandywine, I think about uh, a, 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 a mid-sized asset manager that has the flexibility and the resources being part of a larger parent to really cover the globe and really think about fixed income assets in, in a when we get into the philosophy and the process in a little bit of a more unique way than maybe some of our, our, our peers. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, so I've seen that you are part of a very long-term experience investment team at Brandywine. So can you tell us a little bit about how your team is structured, um, how you work together with your colleagues, um, how the team you're in the team is with Brandywine and the collaboration? Uh, absolutely. So if you think about it, uh, we're a very flat organization and we have a very long tenure team. Um, our turnover tends to be very low, uh, modest, very modest um, to, to de minimis turnover with respect to those that actually touch the assets on a day to day basis over. And, and I'm going to use sort of like 1992, 1994 is the, 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 the sort of the starting point for this global fixed income franchise that we're talking about today. 
Um, and it really uh, lends itself to, to our founders, uh, David Hoffman and Steve Smith, who really started that business back in 1992, probably uh, well, well before I was in the business and probably many of us on the, uh, on, on the call. Uh, but, but it's really thinking about how those macroeconomic uh, data, how those macroeconomic cycles, how both monetary and fiscal conditions drive business cycles, credit cycles, and what the influence is on asset prices um, across the globe. And, and it's really that, that nuanced, as well as um, I think maybe some of your, your, your clients and your guests on the call today may, may know uh, the head of our macroeconomic research, uh, Francis Scotland, who was at BCA for um, quite a number of years, but uh, really joined us in 2006 and institutionalized uh, much of what, what we were doing uh, with respect to that macroeconomic research, really building out that database and capability. But what I really wanted to get to is he says it most eloquently for, for us. Um, and, and this is going to be very important as we go through the conversation today, as we're talking about uh, fixed income assets and what it really means. And, and that is summarizing risk. And risk, and the way he summarized it for, for us, is the probability of the permanent loss of clients' capital. So that's going to permeate much of our discussion today as we go through um, the, the rest. Brian, I think you are muted at the moment. Could you please try to unmute? Perfect. Sorry about that. I'm not exactly sure what happened. Um, but what, what I was trying trying to get to, we're a very collaborative team. To, viewed as generalists. Uh, we we want to look across the asset classes. We're looking for valuation anomalies in asset prices within fixed income, and then thinking about the ability to allocate to those sectors when there's a significant degree of cheapness. And that cheapness then would, uh, what, from our perspective, would actually reduce the risks in a portfolio. So this is going to be a very different philosophy than that risk of thinking about um, sort of the the, the, the tracking error risk or a risk relative to an index. There, there's that That is a risk, but there's also a risk about the absolute return that you're looking for. And so we want to think about uh, the totality of that risk and structure portfolios that are very flexible, that are dynamic. Um, and, and when you start to think about it, you want to have sort of a, this holistic approach to fixed income. You want to think about those macroeconomic drivers that I mentioned a few minutes ago. Uh, central bank policy, uh, fiscal policy, but you also want to think about it when you're moving towards spread instruments or, or spread products. You want to think about the risks that you're interjecting into a fund or into a portfolio at that point with respect to that idiosyncratic credit risk. So you need both a top-down perspective as well as a very strong fundamental bottom-up due diligence to bring those two together to be able to craft and construct portfolios that are reflective of where the market is as well as where the market is going to be. And, and again, I think Wayne Gretzky um, had said it uh, probably um, in, in, in bringing, back, bringing into it that, that sports type of analogy, you have to skate to where the puck is going to be to be able to produce returns and protect clients' portfolios and be able to uh, think about what type of uh, risk and returns you want to uh, craft for your clients based on their own risk tolerances. Um, so I, I think you had one other part of that that I might have skirted a little bit around. So, so again, being generalists, we look for consensus building. And so, um, again, the greater the consensus, the larger or more focused and concentrated a position size will be. Um, so if we don't have a, as great of a consensus, so it'll probably be a smaller type of allocation. And again, we're going to be looking across the uh, developed market rates markets. We're going to be thinking about uh, uh, credit markets, whether it's investment grade, whether it's below investment grade, whether it's structured credit. Uh, we also want to think about those emerging markets as well, developed market, or excuse me, um, the, the, the rates markets in emerging markets or the corporate credit in emerging markets. Um, and as well as thinking about the ability to utilize uh, instruments that might be able to reduce volatility in a portfolio, synthetic instruments such as uh, in investment grade or below investment grade corporate credit uh, synthetic, such as in, in Europe, whether it's the main or crossover, in the US it's IG or it's um, the high yield index. Um, idiosyncratic risk may not necessarily be the best way to hedge out um, 
uh, a, a risk in a portfolio. So that would be individual CDS. That might not necessarily be uh, the best tool. Uh, it could be at some point in, in, in varying markets. But again, we want to think about all of these in that totality, that holistic perspective to taking um, uh, risk within fixed income assets. And, and I, I guess when we think about it, you've also got to consider the the foreign exchange component or that FX component, because that is a significant driver of risk. But you can manage that. You can think about uh, how that impacts the asset price of the underlying bond, but maybe you hedge out the, the, the currency risk uh, to, to uh, reduce volatility or, or to have a, maybe a smoother ride or performance ride uh, for your ultimate and, and client at that point in time. So I think those were the questions you were, you were, you were getting at, Barbara. Um, yes, thank you much, Brian. And just to sum it up for our participants, um, there are some key points. Um, risk is very important, where I also have um, additional questions um, later. But first, something you've mentioned, which I find is really distinct from other strategies that we see is um, the value-oriented approach that you are following. And here, I'm very curious to hear more details. First, because finding value in bonds um, compared to other asset classes, I think it has become more and more difficult over time, over the last years. So I'm wondering how you do it and maybe also how you bring together the top down with the bottom up perspective. So could you please um, give us um, an example? Uh, uh, absolutely. And there, there's multiple examples over the past day decade as we think about it. We can think about the, the European sovereign crisis back earlier in uh, the 2010s. You can think about the energy crisis in 2015. And then you can think about uh, COVID. And maybe we'll go into that in a little bit more detail, as well as sort of that, that summer of the Trump tariff uh, war with, with China. Um, and so let's start, let's back that up and unpack that question that you had. Uh, you talked about value and, and what does that mean? So as we start to think about introducing or, or credit risk into a portfolio, we think about screening and filtering and um, looking at a universe ac across, uh, I guess you would call it four fa fundamental factors. Um, and those factors, and the last one I'm going to mention is the, the, the most important, but first we think about the business model, uh, whether or not it's a strong business model, weak business model, uh, is it a disruptor or is it a melting ice cube, as we like to say, within a, sort of the corporate credit land. Um, and then as we move, move down, we think about the position in the capital structure. I mean, is it a senior piece of paper? Is it a junior piece of paper? Uh, and then what are the strengths of the, the, the covenants? Uh, those are all very important, but most importantly for us is really what we call the recover it. So if, if we're wrong, how do we think about what those assets are worth at the end of the day, if you have to think about it from a, a restructuring perspective? And again, we don't want to have, we're not aiming to get to that, that type of position, but what we're thinking about is what if we are wrong? We're always thinking about what happens if we're wrong, because as bondholders, I think everybody on your call or on this webinar knows that we really have more downside than upside. We're not equity investors. We don't have that ability to see infinite returns. In theory, we're lucky to get back par, right? I mean, that's really what the goal is or objective of fixed income. It's that preservation of capital. And we have much more downside risk if there is an event that we're talking about. So from that perspective, value is really focused. And, and again, you're not going to be able to, to get it in every security you're looking at. But what you're looking to do is get to your attachment point, meaning what price you buy a security at, you're trying to buy that as close to the recovery rate as possible. Because what that does is it minimizes the downside. So you, you have less, less downside, less risk of loss, as well as reducing the volatility um, that you would be potentially riding out and really positions you, and if your investment thesis is right, for that asymmetric return profile to capture what you think is going to be that upside potential. And so that would be sort of from a, a credit type, spread type of perspective. And then when you think about it from a developed markets, generally, and again, you've got to continue to think about this in light of where the current markets are, you want to think about uh, from a real rates perspective, and you're looking for the actual real rates to be positive or, or um, high. But again, you want to think about it um, in terms of what the underlying monetary policies are, what the, the conditions are from a fiscal perspective. Um, so even, even a negative uh, real rate could potentially be a good, good investment. But again, just using that to frame what, what, what value is. But what that really means is it means patiently rotating across sectors and asset classes and fixed income given that macroeconomic condition. So as you think about uh, sort of that first example I mentioned, the, the European sovereign crisis, as uh, Draghi came out and uh, 
did everything he could to support the, the, the union. And that was his famous butterfly speech or bumblebee speech, excuse me, uh, where, where, where he equated the union to, to the bumblebee and that it shouldn't be able to fly, but he's going to keep it together. Um, as, as he provides that support, you can then get a sense of being able to rotate from um, or into uh, those sovereigns, the, the peripheral sovereigns, because that's going to be supported. And as those heals, because the sovereigns are generally the underlying of the credit conditions, as those sovereigns start to heal, you can then move down into uh, corporate credit or, or structured credit, uh, as you think about it in the European Union. But again, bringing everything together, you also need to think about the FX component of it. So if uh, he's going to support it, that might be a depreciating euro under that scenario. And so you want to think about whether or not you need to hedge out that currency risk at that point in time. Um, similarly, you can think about the, the challenges around the energy crisis, as well as deflationary periods uh, coming from both the EU and from China during 2015 and 16. Uh, you want to think about um, the, the, the valuation anomalies and how to protect uh, credit risk. Um, and that would be to add long duration during those periods of time, if you're very comfortable with the underlying uh, due diligence you did on those, those credit instruments. And then I, I think fascinating, it's really what um, transpired in um, 2020, as well as 2021. And I, I think uh, th this slide is actually an interesting slide to think about what, what, what transpired. Um, when you start to think about where valuation anomalies were at the end of 2020, uh, valuation anomalies really didn't exist. So if you came into from 2019 into 20 with a portfolio that was a little bit more um, conservative, you're going to have spread widening because the pandemic was uh, a challenge to all asset classes. Um, but if you can manage the credit risk uh, appropriately, thinking about information and, and, and valuation, uh, you, you can then take advantage of spread widening to reposition your portfolio from a, a short dated, high quality portfolio to capture that significant spread widening that happened uh, at the end. Well, it actually started in February and March, but sort of bottomed out in that March, April timeframe as the central bankers of the world, whether it was the, the, the Fed or the ECB or even the PBOC, all coming into the market to provide support. And then they also provided support explicitly to investment grade corporate credit, which implicitly supports the longer end of the curve as well as lower quality assets. Uh, as you think about that unfolding, that allows you that opportunity to extend your duration at significant uh, risks to the portfolio and, and what happens, though, is uh, this is a snapshot showing you the, the first quarter of 2021 20, as well. Um, you're actually able to start to monetize that long duration position that you put on a portfolio because the spreads had normalized. We had retraced back to pre-pandemic levels um, and retracing back to pre-pandemic levels really takes that valuation anomaly out, out of the picture. And so you don't have a valuation anomaly that really uh, uh, positions you for that asymmetric risk return profile profile that I talked about at the beginning of our conversation today. Um, so uh, actively managing uh, the portfolios based on the varying uh, data and inputs that continue to drive asset prices is what's critical. And so uh, what you can see is that extending duration during 2020 was very accretive. Shortening it by the fourth quarter of 2020 really played into uh, the first quarter of 2021 and really a, a, a allows um, uh, clients to take advantage of uh, the, the risk um, sentiment that was a, a, a view that inflationary pressures were going to be driving risk assets um, higher, um, specifically equities because of the inflationary pressures, but which would be then potentially negative for uh, some fixed income assets, especially those high quality um, government duration bonds that would be at risk under that type of scenario. And so when we put all of this together, it's an actively managed portfolio, dynamic in its nature across these asset classes, really trying to frame that, that, that question about risk that you had, Barbara. And thank you very much, Brian. So, as you said, um, I also have the impression that it's uh, not possible anymore, like in the past, to have like a buy and hold bond portfolio, but that you have to uh, to be flexible, uh, that you have to take into account different types of bonds, and then of course um, you have to you have to be opportunistic, or you have have to have the possibility to act opportunistic when spreads are high um, to benefit, because because uh, like like just holding um, long government bonds um, with the current rates, it just it just um, doesn't yield enough. Um, 
especially in, in European government bonds where rates are mostly negative um, or yields are mostly negative. Um, so I think um, this is really an outdated strategy. So therefore you are following an all weather approach. So, and you are really flexible, which is good, but could you um, just give us um, some details how we have been positioned, for example, um, last year before the COVID drawdown and after the COVID drawdown, um, and that, that we see um, how you have managed to fund during that very challenging market environment. Uh, absolutely. So coming into that COVID period, valuations, again, were somewhat where we are today. So there, there wasn't a valuation anomaly. They weren't screamingly cheap. And so what we had positioned was in very short front end maturity bonds and a lot of money center banks. And again, periods were very different though than where we are today because yields you could actually get a yield on a two or three year piece of paper, whereas today you're probably still under 1%. We could get two, three, um, maybe even three and a half percent um, in, in some of that type of paper back then. So again, a very different uh, type of market. But if you had a portfolio, which is where the, this portfolio that we're talking about today was positioned, large allocation to those money center, large allocation to uh, multinationals that were the, the single A, double A um, global names that you would think of, the S&P 500 type of, of companies, those those global uh, companies that, that, that have operations all around the world with a very low allocation towards uh, below investment grade corporate credit, um, taking advantage of, of the opportunity for the new issuance primary market and the secondary market in the end of March, April and May, we were able to uh, reposition those, those corporates and add, I think previously, um, at the beginning of 2020, it was about one year of duration that came from 50% of the portfolio in those corporates that I, I was mentioning. We were able to add three to four years of duration in essentially very similar type of uh, instruments, maybe not necessarily all the money center banks, but in those large multinationals, we were able to add 30 year paper when you had uh, yields that were uh, being issued at four, four and a half percent. So spreads that were very wide, historical rides when you look at it from a standard deviation perspective off the charts. Um, and as well, taking advantage of the uh, high yield credits that we had in the portfolio, or those below investment grade, grade names, adding to the ones that we own because that underwriting standard that I talked about, that due diligence, uh, we didn't believe that they had any type of default risk. Uh, these had very strong uh, business models that we talked about. They had very strong asset protection. And so we could just dial those up and increase those allocations um, as well as uh, towards the end of the year, taking advantage of the asset class. And, and again, this is still an asset class, especially in Europe, that's still been a little bit tainted, uh, but didn't have the support of the central bankers or or the, the fiscal authorities, uh, specifically in the US, was really the structured credit market, being able to increase that allocation, uh, which was a way that we would argue was a way to actually de-risk the portfolio, uh, because we think that the house price appreciation uh, uh, continues to remain strong, uh, employment continues to pick up. All of those are strong underlying fundamentals for the, the assets. Again, it's not going to be a, a, a significant return, but we do think it's a very stable return and serves the purpose of, of fixed income. And again, unfortunately, it's still been a tainted asset class since the great financial crisis back in the mid 2000s, think 2007, 2008, um, around the housing crisis. Uh, and, and then I, I guess more recently in 2021, really focused on trying to shorten up the portfolio. We don't want to necessarily have significant credit risk in the portfolio. And, and we still, um, even despite what you're seeing to, today and last week, um, still concerned about the potential for maybe a, a move higher in rates. So we want to try to isolate the portfolios from uh, uh, volatility around rates and really just try to capture what we think is a, a smoother ride within some of the, those credit spreads that we think um, don't necessarily get the, the, the same vol volatility that you're going to get in, in some of the, the riskier um, credit spread uh, products that we, we could be looking at. Um, and again, so really want to focus on uh, maturities of call it three years and in. If you think about those management teams, if they have that strong underlying asset, they have a good management team and they've got a good business model, they're going to be able to refinance. We're going to get a very good return and potentially have the, the, the ability then to uh, roll that those, those proceeds into uh, yields on paper that's going to be issued at a much higher level. So again, really trying to think forward, again, trying to, as I said before, skate to where that puck is going to be. Um, and, and that's where, where I think it's a, a, a 
great strategy um, and, and still very important for clients to have in their portfolios uh, because a, a, as as this world unfolds, it's going to be very interesting to see uh, what, what, what transpires. I have another question on risk management. We already touched on that on the company level, on the company stability level. Um, but um, the strategy is highly flexible. You you can theoretically you can go up to 100% in very risky assets. But when we look at um, last year's drawdown during the pandemic, with with a minus 5.5%, that's that's not much um, compared with other flexible bond strategies, which is um, which is um, good. Um, so also on portfolio level, how do you mitigate that risk, especially because you're also looking for buying the dip and these kind of strategies, these kind of contrarian strategies usually comes with a higher volatility in crisis times. So how have you handled all that um, on portfolio level? A fantastic question, because that's what we struggle with with every day. And I say struggle, meaning that's what we deliberate over. It's what we think about it. What It's what keeps us up at night. And um, again, I'm going to start with uh, Francis's comment around risk being the probability of the permanent loss of clients capital. So as we start or we use that as the starting point and then uh, staying true to our, our philosophy and process around focusing on those valuation anomalies uh, from a portfolio level, uh, it really is incorporated from the start. Uh, so. We, we've actually incorporated it from uh, our, our philosophical perspective. And with that mindset, we, we start from a very different point uh, of the, the fixed income universe, where we're looking across all of those fixed income assets to identify where we think risk has been priced in. And then we're trying to question that and analyze that and, and stress test that 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 scenario or, or that, that investment thesis to be able to then construct a portfolio. And again, the construction part of it is another element. So again, we talked about being more focused or curated um, with respect to the position sizing. It's also got to do with that, that consensus building. So uh, the, 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 the higher the consensus or the greater the consensus, uh, it's the slightly the larger or greater that position weight in the portfolio can be. Um, so if we don't have that, that consensus, there means there's probably concerns uh, across the firm uh, amongst my peers and my colleagues uh, here at Brandywine about whether or not we should be bearing that much risk. Um, so it, again, it, it's throughout this whole process that we think about uh, risk. But again, as I, I, I think we, we may have touched on it a little bit about that recovery. It's the underlying due diligence that is uh, really the, the essence to it, really trying to stress test portfolios as well as the individual securities. So again, we're going to run portfolios through stress tests to understand uh, what, what the outcome is if you shock uh, moves in credit spreads or moves in uh, developed market rates uh, or, or, or even uh, commodities to see what what uh, and, it, and this is under a static scenario, what a portfolio would look like under that type of scenario. But then again, on the individual level, we want to stress test these. Uh, we want to look for structured credits. Uh, what would happen under a structured credit scenario if it looked like the financial crisis? And that was a devastating crisis. Um, and when we stress test them, we're looking for de minimis uh, potential losses under that type of scenario. Very similar with respect to having, and, and this is why we're, we're front end loaded on uh, the these credit spread instruments that we're talking about. Really focused on 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 the front end because we we think that's what allows us not to have that drawdown or those types of volatility, um, that volatility injected into the the return stream that one would experience. So it, again, it, it's throughout the whole process. I would say it's been incorporated into. In, or ingrained in it to everybody's DNA by, again, thinking about uh, uh, Steve and David as the founders of our fixed income franchise. And it's really the, the hallmark of what we, we at Brandywine have been doing for 30 plus years. Thank you very much. Um, so um, we have touched on risk, but I also would like um, to touch on returns because the fund had produced 7.6% annual return over the last few years. Which is um, which is a lot, um, especially um, regarding um, the, the peers of the global bond category. Um, we, um, so, therefore, I'm wondering: um, Can you tell us um, where the um, where the return drivers um, or what the return drivers of the past years were, and maybe also if um, what your expectations um, towards future returns are? 
Absolutely. And maybe we should start with the, the tougher question, because that's that's probably the most important um, question is what return expectations are. And so I, I think we've got to be very pragmatic about this. Uh, I think return expectations have to be uh, level set, as one would uh, like to say. Um, I think the starting point is what's critical uh, with respect to where returns can be from today uh, going forward. Uh, I think returns are, are going to be challenged to reach levels that uh, you highlighted where we were um, a, a couple years ago. But that doesn't mean we can't still have uh, positive and attractive returns. I just don't think that absolute number can be uh, that high given uh, the starting point of where, if you look at where investment grade spreads are, or if you look at where uh, below investment grade corporate spreads are. Um, all of those starting points uh, will, will be Will, will result in more muted returns. But again, I think very constructive uh, returns uh, should be had from uh, these varying asset classes that we're talking about. And when you um, uh, de deconstruct um, an index, I, I do think that the, the front end of the corporate curve is going to outperform uh, much of the, the other uh, part of the, the assets. Now, um, one of the challenges that we have in front of us right now, and, and this is the immediate, and again, we're not arguing that you should be, uh, we have to think about the immediate, but we're also trying to think about what the returns are going to be over the next six months, 12 months, one year, three years, uh, and not just uh, the, the next month, but th there is a, a, a potential um, concern that we could have potential inflation um, and pressure on interest rates towards the, the higher side over, over a shorter period, but longer term, given a potential misallocation of capital that we might have had um, during the pandemic, given the aggregate debt levels. All of these um, topics have been discussed by many uh, different pundits over time, uh, aging uh, demographics, um, aggregate debt, as well as um, technology. All of those could keep a lid on inflation and actually point towards yields um, on the developed market being driven lower, uh, which again, could be very supportive for these uh, more spread type of products that we're talking about. So as we were talking uh, to clients at the beginning of, of the year, uh, we, we were talking about mid single digit types of returns for 2021. Um, may, maybe, uh, again, if that would for fortuitous than 2022, maybe the same to a, a touch lower. But again, uh, very much providing what fixed income investors should be looking for in their their, their portfolios. Now, how did we get to the, those returns though? It, it was really that, um, and, and I think the words I used were dynamic rotation. Um, portfolios were actively um, managed. Um, we continue to actively ma manage them, but it was a rotation from, Again, if you think about earlier in 15 and 16, continuing to bring down uh, corporate credit exposure and allocating it towards uh, some developed market sovereigns, um, as, as well as a little bit of uh, some of the structured credit in there. So that really set you up for the next few years after that period of time where uh, there was a significant um, performance generated from both an allocation to investment grade corporate credit as well as developed market sovereigns. So th those are sort of the asset allocation decisions that were really driving uh, the performance to, to, to be able to have those types of returns. Um, and again, the, the challenge this year had been, uh, at least in the first quarter, and you're seeing the retracement of that in the second quarter was for those benchmarks, uh, whether it's a global ag or, or some type of multiverse, it was really that duration component of it that really drove that negative return for those indices during during that time period, and capturing some of that back. But we're trying to avoid that type of volatility by really focusing on that front end, trying to have five years and in type of uh, paper um, that we think is going to be money good and doesn't have that type of default risk. So again, you're not going to see a significant credit risk from our perspective in, in, in those in these types of portfolios. So thank you much. Um, before we come to the outlook, um, which we already had a little bit of an outlook, um, I would like to ask another question about ESG because um, because um, you are also um, 
Integrating ESG into the fund, but I can imagine that it's difficult in some areas like emerging market debt or high yield debt. These are usually sectors that are not known to have so many sustainable um, participants. So how strict um, can you be regarding ESG in the fund? How are you doing it? And um, what do you do to not shrink your investable universe too much in these areas? Um, so e ESG is something that's probably been lagging and, and has been necessary, right? If we think about what the concept of, of ESG really is, it's really, and I think fixed income investors, especially those that are, are very good at fixed income investors have been thinking about the ESG or within an ESG framework for, for a very long time. It's really thinking about taking those contingent liabilities and trying to quantify what those impacts of that contingent liability is. Um, and it, it, again, we're going to continue to see as industries evolve different um, ways to think about the, the, the those contingent liabilities and what the risks are w within those. And, and what I'm trying to think of pointing out is going to be the challenges around uh, the, the the solar or the greening, if you think about the electric uh, vehicle, I mean, because there, 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 and there's still a significant uh, divergence between some people. There, there's some that will argue uh, that it's a significant beneficiary, while others will argue that there's still risks to the, the, um, the, 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 to the environment when you think about it from a mining perspective and some of the rare earth uh, metals that are going to go into it. So what we're trying to do with ESG um, and I, I think we've been trying to do it for quite a bit of time because we want to think about what those contingent liabilities are, because that's going to ultimately impact valuation of these companies. But we're taking a slightly different approach here. And I, and I think it's more uh, nuanced and a little bit more unique. And I, I think it's more appropriate for fixed income investors. What we're trying to do is actually have our analysts and PMs, myself included, we want to have everybody looking at ESG as well as the uh, financial statement analysis, sort of that more traditional fixed income analysis or work that you have to do, because we want to really bring those two together. We, uh, we find that if we understand all of it, we can have a better understanding of the, the data and a better interpretation of both the ESG data as well as the financial data and how the two of them intersect and what the risks are to a portfolio. So again, we're doing it at um, the, the research level and in, in totality. Um, we're, we're not having two separate teams that we then have to synthesize uh, to bring together to, to um, try to understand what the impact of financials are to the SG and what the financials can impact the, the ESG. Um, so uh, when you think about something like Pemex, we're, we're involved with um, the Climate Change Committee. Uh, we're participating with that as well as um, having numerous trips down to Mexico City to um, talk with management, to talk with um, uh, um, the oil engineers, the private equity uh, guys that are down there to, to understand what what is uh, transpiring in Mexico around it, as well as um, being very focused and cognizant of the, the challenges around um, the environmental risks, uh, especially if they build a refinery, uh, what the environmental risks are with respect to the pipelines that have been tapped for illegal oil usage or, or, or the stealing of oil, um, and, and then just sort of left to bleed into the environment um, after, after uh, the cartels have taken as much oil as they, they want it. And so, so again, we, we're very cognizant of it, but trying to um, implement it in a way that uh, really adheres to who we are here at Brandywine. So I understood that it's more about engagement with the companies. Um, um, than um, just avoiding investing in certain sectors, right? Like like PMX, like the PMX example. Uh, yes, I mean, if if we if if there is reception to be um, engaged mm -hmm. as well, right? I mean, uh, that's still a, a challenge. I mean, uh, we as fixed income investors don't necessarily have the same rights as an equity holder might have with respect to the ability to vote in a shareholder vote. Um, but we can engage with them. Uh, we can uh, work with our colleagues and we're doing this across Brandywine. We do have a, uh, an equ two equity teams. Um, so there are cross uh, holdings or overlapping holdings that uh, we're, we're able to uh, get involved with from that perspective as well. And also uh, there might be some areas you're investing in where you can 
have a larger impact or make larger improvements than maybe within companies um, or sectors um, that are usually known as greeners. So the impact you do with your engagement might be might be even higher for the environment um, in an oil company than, for example, in the bank. <laughs> um, Absolutely. And some of the companies are doing some very unique things out there now. Now, Occidental Petroleum has started to do a carbon recapture program that may actually become another business line for them that they can s sell to other um, companies, whether they're EMP or, or other entities that have the uh, the need to capture recapture carbon. So, I mean, there 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 is a a positive coming out of it that, that you can actually already see, and it's not something that is further in the future. These are actual tangible results right now. Thank you very much for speaking about ESG and and your engagement. Um, the last point I would like to touch, unless we might have any questions from the audience. So I just want to encourage the audience also um, to send over the question in the chat, either in English or in German, I would translate it. So if you have any question, now is your chance to ask Brian. Um, otherwise, I would like to move on to our outlook. So. Um, we have already spoken a little bit about inflation. So um, what do you expect in terms of um, rate hikes and inflation over the coming years, which seems to me like quite a challenge um, for the fixed income markets, even more than we had in the past. Um, so can you tell us about your expectations and maybe also where you see opportunities in the market and why fixed income investment should still play a role in um, investors' portfolios. Absolutely. So that is the biggest challenge that we have um, around our investment table um, sitting here in Philadelphia, is really trying to understand what the path is going to be for the various central banks. And we've had a little bit of a divergence recently, right? Um, you've seen more of the emerging markets be a little bit more hawkish, um, and maybe some of the other central banks, um, even, even the more developed ones, whether it's the uh, uh, RNBZ, uh, Australia is talking a little bit along those lines, as well as the Bank of Canada um, and, and the Bank of England. Uh, so a very different profile is being set out than what we saw, let's think, call it back sort of the 2000 teens, if that's the right way to characterize that decade, uh, where, where the Fed was probably the more, um, uh, I guess, hawkish central banker at that point in time. And now the question is, uh, Jerome Powell and, and his colleagues continue to argue for a, a very, uh, I guess I'll call it a, a slightly more dovish type of bias, um, albeit uh, the, the last, um, and again, we're in a blackout period right now for the meeting next week, but uh, might've been interpreted as a little bit more hawkish uh, from, from his last statements. Uh, but he's definitely um, probably lagged uh, the, that other central bank policy I, I just mentioned. So uh, as we start to think about the, the question about tapering or, or the thoughts about tapering to taper, the talks to taper to the taper, uh, we've got 80 billion of treasuries, 40 billion of mortgages, and we're still sitting um, at uh, the, the zero bound as, as we, we, we think about it. Um, the challenge continues to be, and again, we've seen it, um, I think all around the globe, the supply chain issues. Uh, we're seeing a real world experiment unfold in the US right before our eyes with respect to the extended unemployment benefits. Um, those benefits will expire officially in September. They could be extended by Congress. I, I'm not exactly sure how to put odds on that given how um, divisive uh, Congress, or, or yeah, I guess divisive Congress is right now. Um, might not be the right exact word to use, but um, how split they are, how different their, their opinions are. Um, but again, again, we've actually seen 26 different states roll back those, those benefits. So I think by uh, we call it that first Friday in August and that first Friday in September, we're going to see if whether or not um, that is going to alleviate some of these supply chain bottlenecks with respect to uh, the, the, the need for businesses to find employment or their ability to find em em employment. And then what we haven't talked about yet, um, and unfortunately it appears that uh, it, it's being part of the narrative about the reopening being a little slower, the global reopening being a little slower than uh, one had thought it was going to be is the Delta variant or the Delta two variant, um, also with the possibility for maybe the Lambda coming out of Peru. 
uh, really around the, the re global reopening and uh, especially tourism and travel. And uh, I think some of the, the Southern European countries get probably close to 10% of their, their GDP from, from tourism. And we may have another lost summer uh, potentially here uh, on our hands, especially given that we're already in mid-July um, and August is rolling around. Uh, so we've got this tension and cross currents that are, are very challenging for um, the, the central bank is very challenging for this inflation na narrative. Uh, we have seen CPI and PPI print at some of their highest levels, and that continues to, to move up. Um, the Fed has uh, argued and is continuing to argue that it's going to be very transitory. We've had um, several other, uh, I guess, large investors argue it's much more permanent than they think. Um, but, but again, I, I think when you start to look at where the growth profiles are and you start to look at where ultimate growth is further out, you will we'll probably get back down to closer to, to normalized growth of um, one to two percent um, with respect to sort of that developed market world, ex-China. Um, and, and that that is going to really probably allow the Fed to uh, maybe walk this uh tapering back a little bit and give them a little bit more uh, room, especially uh, given what we saw over the weekend with the UAE and Saudi Arabia uh, coming to terms around uh, the oil production increases. So um, again, again, that probably has put a, a shorter term outside of uh, some uh, political event, a, a shorter term lid on uh, oil prices, especially given what we just talked about with the, the Delta variant and the, the slowing, slower reopening that's going to, to occur. So um, that's probably the, the real reason we've seen um, much of this rate retracement that we saw from the first quarter that we had to sell off. And now in the second and, and into the start of the third quarter here, we, we've seen that, that retracement. And so uh, the other element that I have on the screen right now is really that, that China, Chinese credit impulse. Um, this is a global credit impulse, but you can see that China is the biggest component of that. It's that uh, I guess orange or auburn type of color underneath the, the bar. And you can really see um, that, that it is uh, slowed dramatically and it's really going to have an impact on asset prices going, going forward. And the, the challenge that we all have to think about is peak liquidity or peak everything at the end of the day, probably peak GDP, peak PMIs. Um, and, and again, there's going to be some relative value trades to be made in, in, in between. Uh, but again, I, I, what we're thinking about when we put all this together is still maintaining, um, and I guess I can't emphasize it enough from uh, my conversations, is still maintaining that much shorter bias than any type of index, if that's what you want to use with respect to your your, your credit spread type of um, allocation, as well as maybe here tactically um, uh, uh, looking to maintain your duration exposure and, and then starting to think about whether or not um, that there's any opportunities in some more esoteric type of asset classes like the uh, structured credit, which I, I think and where, where we have positioned um, is, is a, a very good opportunity um, in, in our estimation as we're sitting here today um, as the data stands. So I think those were sort of um, some, some of the questions or some points to address the question that you asked, Barbara. Thank you very much, Brian, for your outlook. Um, yes, um, there will still be some uncertainty um, in the market, uncertainty around um, also during the unpredictable outcome of COVID, also because of the Delta variant. So, so it's good. Um, it's, it's good to have like um, um, a strategy that puts um, risk in the focus. But it's also good when you have like let's like to point out have a flexible strategy to capture your opportunities because sometimes they can arise and they can be gone very quickly. So it's good when you are like an agile team um, and have an and have a flexible process to benefit from opportunities when they arise. Like we've seen um, last year during COVID when spreads widened and then the market went back to normal. Um, I would say. Um, much quicker than in the in history, in my opinion, or as I had the impression. So yeah, you have to be able to capture these opportunities pretty quickly. And just buying um, a long duration um, index, the bond fund might not do the trick <laughs> going forward, right? No, absolutely. I mean, that, that's that's been the hallmark of Brandywine since uh, our fixed income founding. It's uh, being uh, an op opportunistic manager. And opportunistic doesn't just mean um, from the, the long side, right? Or from that uh, ability to take advantage of 
significant widening. It's also mean be defensive, right, with respect to your positioning. If there are none of those valuation opportunities that you and I have been talking about today, then you don't need to stretch for risk. And there may be a period of time where um, may, maybe you'll, you, you'll underperform an index um, slightly. But a, again, it's more about the absolute return at the end of the day when you, when you think about it. Yes, so um, thank you very much, uh, Brian, for being here today. It was a pleasure speaking to you. Also, thanks uh, to all of you participants um, that you have been in the call today. Um, you can find a summary or the recording of the webinar on www.scopexplorer.com. There you find also information about the funds and also about our upcoming webinars. So I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. So thank you very much. and. Have a great day and see you at one of our next scope webinars. Bye. Thank you.